handouts. All right, are we good? You're good. Tim? Yeah. Thank you in advance to our videographer, Tim Nixon, for putting this down for posterity. Um, I've done this a couple, well, I think this is my fourth or fifth or sixth time doing this. This is the biggest crowd so far, so I am delighted. This is, as I said uh, in the announcement, this is done in conjunction with RCIA class, so if you see some folks you don't know, chances are pretty good. They might be in the class to learn more about the faith or perhaps seek sacraments. And so I wanted to, originally was the idea was to teach them about the Mass, and then I thought, you know what? Let's open it up to whoever wants to come. Because no matter where we're at in our faith journeys, no matter where we're at in our experiences, we can always learn more about the main thing that we do as Catholics, which is come here. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that the Mass, primarily the Eucharist, is the source and the summit of everything that we do in the Christian life. So if we look at it that way, the source and the summit, it all flows from this table right here, from this altar. We come to it when we come to worship, when we come to receive what God has for us, especially in the Eucharist, which is His very body and blood. We get nourished, we get strengthened, we go and announce the gospel of the Lord, we take it to the world. And the idea is, when we take it to the world, that we bring them back. We bring them here. If not to the physical location, at least a little closer to Jesus Christ the whole idea. So tonight is going to be um, relatively fast-paced because if a mass at real speed takes an hour, breaking it down is going to take a little longer. And I'm going to try, I'm going to cover everything that we do in mass. We may not cover everything as far as the vessels and the vestments and all that, but my goal is to explain a little more what we do, why we do it, and where it's found in Scripture. And that's where those notes are going to come in handy. If you've got, you should have three things. One is the Mass Explained, which is six pages of pretty much straight up notes. Scripture references all over it. All over it. So you can go back and research that and follow your references and maybe some some lights might come on in your mind and some bells. Like, oh, that's where that comes from. Oh, and with your spirit. Oh, I get it. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit. And then also, you have the flow chart that I mentioned. And I have found this flow chart to be very helpful. Other people have found it to be helpful. Because if you are coming to Mass for the first time, or you're kind of new to this, or maybe you've just done it over and over and over, and you just do it, and it's very automatic, but really, there is a rhyme and a reason to it, and there's a particular flow. And we will start at the very beginning and go to the end, and we will talk about each little block on that flow chart along the way, and not only how it goes from A to B to C to go, but how they interact with each other, how they intertwine with each other, because it's all part of the same thing. And then, We'll talk about this graphic, Mass is boring, said no angel, saint, or holy soul in purgatory ever. This is a wonderful graphic of what really happens at the Mass. We'll talk more about this, but this is something that you can look at and study for a while, and you may see things and wonder, what is that? Or you might look at that and say, oh, I understand that. Or, I want to know more about that. And we'll talk about that as well. So, with that in mind, let us begin our walk through the Mass with prayer. And what we normally do in our CIA classes, we sing a song and we say a prayer and then we have intentions. Uh, since it's a little bit of a larger crowd tonight and the time is a little compressed, uh, why don't I just, uh, why don't we pray together and I'll offer up a, a closing prayer on behalf of all of us and all of our intentions. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together tonight in your name to learn more about you, to learn more about the love you had for us, that you sent your Son to die for our sins, to rise again from the dead, to conquer sin, to conquer death, and give us the chance to have eternal life with you, face to face and eye to eye, like you meant for in the beginning. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and open our eyes and ears and our hearts to receive what you would have for us. We pray for all those who can't be with us tonight. We pray for those who are traveling. Pray for our family members who are ill or ailing in any way. We pray for all those who are on their own journeys of faith, that you would always be in their minds and in their hearts, and may they hunger and thirst for you. And may you lead them and guide them gently, with love and with direction, leading and guiding us all to your truth, our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask all these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, here we go. You guys ready? All right. So, the Mass. What is it? It's what we do. This is the source and summit of the whole Christian life. And really, there are many beautiful prayers offered in the Mass. But one of the main prayers in the Mass, the Eucharistic prayer, which we'll talk about, there is something in there that the priest says that is very important. And it's when Jesus is having his last supper with his disciples. And he tells them, take and eat. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Take and drink. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And then he says what? Do this in memory of me. That's what we do. That's what we do when we gather together for Mass here. And we come together because God wants to do something in us. He wants to give us something. And what he wants to do is he wants to divinize us. To divinize us. To make us more and more like him. Now, we were all created in the image and likeness of God, male and female. And in our CIA, we studied a little bit about, actually we studied a lot about what happens in Genesis with original sin and Adam and Eve and how that covenant that God made with the human race was really broken by the human beings. And there's only one being who can fix that. There's only one being who can build a bridge from the Creator who is infinite, to the creatures who are finite. And that is somebody who is God and who is human. And that's Jesus. And we just spent three weeks on salvation history, our story of how Jesus is spoken about in the Old Testament, how his arrival was heralded by the prophets, and how he came and dwelt among us, loved us, ministered to us, and died and rose for us. And all of that, all of his life and ministry culminated in what we know as his, his passion, his death and resurrection. Passion, death, and resurrection. One of my professors in, in, in college said it was passion, death, and resurrection. He said PDR, the letters P, D, and R. He says, what does that mean? And we were throwing out all these words, and he just wrote on the board, Passion, Death, and Resurrection, PDR. Everything, everything we do in the church comes to, flows out, and revolves around the Passion, Death, and Resurrection. Of Jesus <coughs> everything, all the sacraments, everything we do in the Mass, that is the focal point. PDR, Passion, Death, and Resurrection. So God wants to divinize us. He created us in his image and likeness so we could share his divine life. He didn't take anything away from himself when he created us. He created us out of his abundant love. And when the original plan in the Garden of Eden hit that snag, God could have 
redeemed us any way he wanted to. Sin could have snapped his fingers and started over. He could have said, well, that didn't work. I'll try it this way. And he could have started over, and we all could have been what I call little God bots walking around. I love you, you love me, we love God. And that's not what God's all about. God's about love. God's about love. And he redeemed us through his son, Jesus Christ, by having him come to earth and dwell among us and go through everything that we go through. Except <coughs> sin. And he dies for us. And he takes sin and death. And he takes it into the grave. But that's not all. If that's the end of the story, then that's not all. He has to rise, leaving sin and death in the grave, giving us the opportunity to have eternal life with him, fully in heaven. This wonderful and abundant life. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Or some translations say, Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. If you've ever been to Mass here at St. Rita, Father Tom's presiding, or if I am up here, you may have, you may have heard us say these words before. Lord Jesus, you came that we may have life and have it to the full. Lord have mercy. Or something like that. That is, we are talking about having life <coughs> fully in heaven, but also here on earth. And on earth, where we experience that connection, that divine connection between us as humans, as creatures, and with God, the Almighty, the most acutely, the place where we have it most acutely is right here. Because right here, in this place, or any Catholic church you go to, during the Mass, heaven and earth meet. They meet. And we get to be a part of them. That's why we come. That's why we come. So how does God divinize us? How does he make us more godlike? Well, in the Mass, also known as the liturgy, it's all over the place. But most acutely in the Eucharist. Because when we take and eat, take and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, when we do that, we are becoming more and more like God. He's giving us himself. He's giving us himself, and as we partake of that, and not just something that's on us or something that's around us. It's something that's in us, and we take it with us. We take him with us as we go. But the other really cool thing is that we do it together. So when you come up and you receive communion, and the minister says, the body of Christ, it's not just four words. There's so much more to it. Yes, you are receiving the body of Christ, but you are also becoming the body of Christ. Why? Because we are doing it together. We're doing it together. That's why we gather together. Some people say, well, I can pray on my own, and I can pray in the woods, and I can pray on the lake, and on the golf course, and in my room. Yes, great, fine. But you can't get the Eucharist on the lake. You can't get the Eucharist on the golf course. You can't get it in a chair in your living room. You can't get the Eucharist at home. Father Tom can. You can't. Because he, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it happens. But we can. So we come here. Now, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, we read about a traditional Jewish sacrifice meal. A solemn feast, this Passover. We, we read about the Passover where God gives Moses very specific instructions how to eat the Passover. And they were to sacrifice a lamb. But not just any lamb, a spotless lamb. A spotless lamb was to be sacrificed. And they took the blood of the lamb and they drained it and they would put it on top of their doors and on the side of their doors. Because in the book of Exodus, we read about Moses having this experience at this bush that was being, that was 
on fire, but it wasn't being consumed, which was God speaking to Moses, saying, you go and lead my people out of slavery, out of Egypt. And he has this back and forth with the Pharaoh, let my people go, no, let my people go. And these ten plagues come down, and you can read all about that in the book of Exodus. But before that tenth plague comes down, which is going to be the death of the firstborn, they eat this Passover meal, and they sprinkle the blood of the perfect spotless lamb over their doors, and the angel of death passes over those houses. The blood of the lamb saved them. Now, a lot of these things that we're going to talk about, especially from the Old Testament, they should ring some bells as far as what we do here at Mass, and that's one of them. Passover. And then they actually ate the lamb. They ate the pure, unblemished lamb to complete the sacrifice. And they also ate unleavened bread. And in this Passover, which celebrated for years and years and years, still celebrated today by the Jewish people, when they celebrate Passover, it's not simply a meal. It's not simply something they do. It's something that's happening. Something that's happening. And when the Jewish people celebrate Passover, they celebrate it as if it is happening now. They are about to leave Egypt. They are eating the unleavened bread. They have sacrificed the lamb. They have put the blood on the doorposts because they are about to leave Egypt. They are about to leave on their exodus. They treat it like it's happening now. It's the same way for us when we come to Mass. I've talked about this before. The event character, it means it's happening now. When we hear God's word proclaimed, he's speaking to each of us now. When we see the action up here on the altar, when we see Father Tom or whoever the priest is with the vessels holding up the bread, holding up the chalice of wine, saying the words, take this all of you and eat of it. This is my body. This is my blood. That's Jesus speaking to all of us. And we should treat it like it's happening now. And looking at the New Testament, looking at the Last Supper, when Jesus was with his friends, and they were, they were celebrating a Passover meal. It says in the Gospels, they sang a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, they came back, they prepared this Passover meal. And at that meal, Jesus inaugurates what we know as the Paschal Mystery. Paschal Mystery, Passover is Pesach in Hebrew, and Pascha in Latin and Greek. <coughs> Paschal Mystery, Passover. Jesus is taking that Passover meal that they are eating and celebrating, but he turns it into something else. He turns it into something more. He turns it into passing over from death to life. He knows what he's going to do. He knows what's going to happen to him the next day. He knows what's going to happen to him that night. He knows he's going to be betrayed, handed over, arrested, tried. He knows he's going to go to the cross. He knows he's going to die. But he also knows that he's going to rise from the dead. He knows what he's going to do. He knows he's going to go through his Passover from death to life. So when we see and participate in the Mass, we are participating in that passing over from death to life. It's another very important reason why we want to be here. We want to be a part of it. And when we do this, we remember and we represent this unique moment in history. It's being represented. It happened once for all. Jesus died once for us. He rose from the dead once for all. But we represent it and we take on the mindset and the heart set that it's happening now. Because there's something called the real presence. You've ever heard this before? The real presence? We believe that 
the bread and the wine truly become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ through the hands of the priest. That's why we need priests. Priests are the ones who, through, it is through the priests that we get the Eucharist. If we don't have priests, we don't have the Eucharist. We're in big trouble. Pray for vocations for priests. We need priests. But we believe that they actually do become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, the real presence. And I don't have the percentage off the top of my head, but I, I, I believe it's in the last Pew survey, I think it was less than 35% of Catholics actually believe that the bread and the wine are the body and blood of Christ. A lot of Catholics don't even believe it anymore. We gotta believe it. If we don't believe it, we are missing the boat. We are missing the boat. Body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And if we look at the book, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, it talks about after the time of Pentecost came and the tongues of fire came down and things were happening, things were changing. And in verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life by the breaking of the bread and the prayers. They were having mass right then, right after the ascension, 40 days after Christ rose from the dead, 50 days after Christ rose from the dead was Pentecost, the church was born, and it started happening. And if you read in the book of Acts, there's this pattern in there where something incredible, something marvelous happened by the power of God through the apostles. And it says, and many came to know Christ that day. Many joined them that day. Many were converted, whatever you want to say. Thousands every day because of what they were doing. And part of it was they were having mass. Now, they didn't have churches and like we do, but they would have mass in people's homes. They would say, okay, where are we gathering tonight for the prayers and the breaking of the bread? Well, we're going to have it at Straight's house. Okay. And then Jay says, okay, so was, we'll, we'll bring bread. Judy says, I'll, I'll bring the wine. And you get together, and you have mass in people's homes. And just 50 years, right around 50 years after John, the Apostle John, died, which is around 100 AD, St. Justin Martyr is one of our very first saints. And according to his writings, they were celebrating the Mass in 150 AD pretty much the same way we're doing it now. Pretty much the same way. The breaking of the bread and prayers. This book is called The Roman Missal. This is the book of the prayers. It is very heavy. When you see a little server trying to lift it and it looks like they're struggling, I assure you they are. Okay? In our history, in our 2018, 20 years, whatever it is, of Christianity, in our, all these years of celebrating the Mass, there have only been three versions of this book. Three versions. This was standardized in the year 1570. Second edition was 1969. The third edition was just a few years ago in 2010. So if you are old timers, if you will, and you wonder, huh, peace be with you, and also with you is now peace be with you and with your spirit. What happened? There was a change in the translation. Prayers haven't really changed. But in 2010, there was a great effort undertaken to try and get back as much as possible to the original translation. So that's why we have some of these differences now in the response and in the creed and some other things. We get these words like consubstantial, right, rather than one in being. It really is the same thing, but the wording's a little different. These are all the prayers that we use at Mass for Sundays, for daily, for all different kinds of occasions. And we actually, here, we have two versions. We have, this is the large version. We have actually a, a smaller book, where the print's a lot smaller. Um, but the, the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Those are the prayers. So, 
Before we actually get into the Mass, let's talk about the Mass itself. The name. What's in a name? Well, in Latin, the dismissal, the dismissal in Latin is ite missa est. She is sent. She is sent. We come here, we partake, we get strengthened, and then we're sent. That's my job. That's my job as the deacon. One of the things I get to do is I get to send people, and when people bust out here early, it really bugs me, because it's like, <laughs> you can't go, because I didn't say you could go. <laughs> well, maybe that's a little bit of a head trip, but you know, you got to get sent. you got to get sent. You go and you bring Christ to the world, and you bring the world back. That's what we do. And the Eucharist, this word, Eucharistia, if I'm saying that right, means thank offering. It means thanksgiving. Eucharist is thanksgiving. And this other word, these are words for the mass. Mass, the <coughs> Eucharist, right? Liturgy, that's a fancy word, liturgy. What does that mean? Liturgy means the participation of the people of God in the work of God. One of my theology classes, um, one of my very first theology classes, we had a little quiz. What's the liturgy? I wrote down, we gather, we sing, we hear the words, we do this, we do that. X, 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 X. What's the answer? The participation of the people of God in the work of God. The end. I never forgot that. Father Peter Clark, thank you. I never forgot that. But that's what we do. And when we come here, we're not spectators. And we are getting, from my perch up here, I think we're getting much better. Because I get to look out as we're singing and praying, and I see, all of you that I see here, I see you're singing and you're praying, and, and then you get the people who, or glory to God in the highest. That's like, dude, we're celebrating, you know? This is a celebration. But it's full, active, conscious participation. We do this together. We pray together. We listen together. We come up. We become the body of Christ together. If we treat it as simply a spectator thing, we're not getting as much out of it as we could. We're not getting as much out of it as we should. Mass is also known as the breaking of the bread, the Lord's Supper, the sacrament, the sacrament of sacraments, the holy sacrifice. You ever heard this? The holy sacrifice of the Mass? The holy sacrifice. When we see all the action happening at the altar with the priest, we picture Jesus doing this. Because Jesus is the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. But also, he is the altar. He's the altar. He's the sacrifice. And that's why when we come into a church and the altar is there and we're walking by it, <coughs> We're coming, approaching it. We make a gesture of reverence. We bow. If you ever notice people walking by and they're doing this, and you get people crisscrossing in front and they're bowing, and if you're first time here or you don't know it, what's going on? You know, you want to make a sign of reverence when you approach the altar because that's where the sacrifice happens, and that's whom the sacrifice is. It's Jesus Himself. The tabernacle is a little bit different. We'll talk about that in a minute, as far as reverence. But coming here, preparing for Mass. It's really a good idea to prepare for Mass. And I know in this world of ours that's fast-paced with everything going on, we don't always have a chance to fully prepare for Mass. We're kind of, i got to get there. Good. Getting here is good. We're glad you're here. Getting here on time is even better. Getting here on time and having a mindset and a heart set that this is going to be really great. This is going to be great. I'm going to hear God's word. I'm going to, I'm going to receive the body and blood of Christ, and I'm going to hang out with my friends. That's really a wonderful mindset. Because if we truly believe that Jesus is present in the Eucharist, we're going to want to go. Now, this was brought to my attention when we did the minute and the mass thing, and we were going through each one. And one week we did, we talked about attending mass. And I wasn't here that weekend, but whoever read it, just read it straight from the book. And it said that it was a grave sin to miss Mass on a weekend. Some people got really upset. 
And they came to me and they said, well, Deacon, that's not fair, that's not nice, that's not kind. I said, I don't care. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the point. That's not the point. The church teaches that coming to Mass is essential and missing Mass is not good. Not good. There are stipulations if you're sick, if you're caring for somebody, if you're traveling. There are arrangements that can be made. But here's the point. Here's the point. If we know, if we know in our mind and in our heart that when we come here that Jesus is going to sacrifice himself for us, that we are going to partake of that, that he gave it all up for us and that we can receive that in our bodies and in our hearts and take that with us. And if we truly believe that that's what's happening and we know that and we say no, Thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. I know you died, you rose, and this and that, the Eucharist, but you know what? I ain't going to go today. That's the problem. That's where the problem is. So let's not get too caught up in, well, why did I not come, or whatever happened. Come. Come. Come because you want to. Yes, we are obliged to, but... God doesn't want that. He doesn't want us to do things because we have to. Right? Otherwise, what are we? If we do things because we have to, what are we? I love you. You love me. We love God. We're God wants. It's not what he wants. He didn't send his own flesh and blood down for us just so we could say, what a pain. i got to do this. We should want to do this. And hopefully we do want to do this. So we come and we try to treat it like it's a little different than everything else. So we try to dress a little better than we would if we were just watching football at home. We try to be on time. We try to stay to the end <laughs> until you are sent. And we try to shut off all devices. This is a new thing if you've been in here for a while. Thank you, Kathleen, for this. This was her her idea, our, our former music director, asking people to silence their cell phones. Let's, if heaven and earth are going to meet, and we're earth, where are we headed? Can't we just leave earth behind for an hour? I mean, put it on silent if you've got emergencies. I totally get that. But the whole idea is let's throw ourselves into this. And now, speaking from my standpoint as a deacon, I will share this with you. If I'm proclaiming the gospel or preaching my homily and someone's phone goes off, I don't like it. That's disrespectful to me. That's saying, yeah, well, I know you're talking, but, you know, I don't care. That's for what it's worth. So you, you came tonight, you're getting these little tidbits that the other people aren't going to get. <laughs> you, you won't believe what the deacon said, Father, uh, in my office. Bishop online too. <laughs> and then next week you have a new deacon and I need some worms. So, 